We had no stove to cook on. We had no heat. We had no light. My, I said, I never was so glad in all my life that God said, let there be light. <laughs> Goodness sakes. It was terrible. They're on now, yes, thank God. <laughs> I tell you, we just get accustomed to being favored, you know. And it's a good thing to be jacked up once in a while. And remember, it can be very different. I was thinking, uh, the communists would have no problem if they wanted to just finish us off. All they'd have to do is cut off all our electricity and stop the water. Hmm? have every one of us. Well, I've got something I want everybody to read today. Uh, I've been reading and it's so good and I think that so much of it we kind of pass over. So I'm going to ask these brothers on the platform to kind of rally around and read for me because I can't read it all. Let me see. If you'll turn to the book of Acts and the sixth chapter. And I'll ask Brother Gay to start, please. Acts 6, chapter 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called a multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and of power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called of the synagogue of the Liber Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. All right, we'll ask Brother Dennis to take it from there, please. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. And then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was de dead, he removed him into this land, wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake so on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for 
and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they should be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all the, his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and, and Canaan and great, uh, the Canaan, is it? And great affliction, and our fathers found no substance, substance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made to his brethren, known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was known, made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Joseph went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers. And we carried over into Shechem, Sight, Shechem. and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham brought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. That same dealt subtly, subtly, subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. And in that time Moses was born and was exceedingly fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. All right, now we, I'd rather Gay take it from there and you get your breath. All right, Brother Gay. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai the angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, and I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. 
For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rampa, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as said the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? All right. I'll take it from there. Thank you. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ear, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have you not, have your fathers not persecuted? And they have slain them who showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom he have been now the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen while calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling out the women, committed them to prison. The Lord's been speaking to me concerning the thought found in that 51st verse. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. Stephen is telling them the truth. Everything that the brothers read in these chapters is positive truth. But that truth angered the religious people of the hour. Now you wonder why. You wonder why truth, anything as beautiful as the word of God and truth, would anger anyone to the point that they would murder someone. 
But the Lord gives us the answer. He says, you uncircumcised of heart and ear, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. I was thinking as the Lord was speaking that to me in the early hours of the morning, I thought what a dangerous place people are in who say that they name the name of the Lord, who say they are Christians and churchgoers, and they have never had their hearts circumcised. And they are passing judgment on other Christians and on their very preachers in their churches. And it's murder. It's just murder. Preachers come to churches and give their very best, and in a year they kick them out. And they make up every manner of tale against them. And the churches are filled with people who have not had the circumcision of heart. The necessity, the absolute necessity of having your heart circumcised, we see in this picture. Not only our hearts circumcised, but our eyes and our ears that we can judge after God's fashion by a circumcised heart. Paul says over in the book of Colossians, the second chapter, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Is that, is that the one that I want? No. No, I'm, I'm, I want to go on from there, from, to the ninth verse. The eighth verse says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised. Now he's speaking to Christians of his hour in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. This is where it happens. Buried with him in baptism, in which also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. God has made a way for us. And as we go on in God and our eyes are opened and we are given ears to understand and hear the truth of God, we realize that when Jesus said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is a package. They were asking, how can you be saved? What do you do to be saved? And this is the answer, repent. You know, there is a repentance unto life. Most people are sorry for the wrong that they've done, and it eats their inwards out all their life. But there's a repentance unto life. 
There's a repentance that God gives for sin. You repent and it's all gone. It's taken care of. It's buried. And you don't go around under condemnation and eating out your soul for what you did back there. God has taken care of it. He gives repentance unto life. How many know what I'm talking about? There is such a thing as repentance unto life. And if you're here today and you have that nagging ache in your soul and you're always being reminded of something you did you shouldn't have done, you've asked God's forgiveness over and over and over again. That's just like the Catholic people that go to, to confession every month. And they usually have the same things to confess over and over and over again. But there is a repentance unto life. You repent of sin. You repent that you were a sinner. When you were a sinner, you could have done anything. You're just lucky you got by with what you did. We're sinners. We're sold under sin. But God gives a repentance unto life. And we come to the Lord and we're finished with sin. We're finished with sin. From now on, we're going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has a family. Jesus has a body. Jesus has a church of a many-membered body. And we are baptized into him. We're baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, we repent. And in the waters of baptism, Paul says, down there, where we've had an uncircumcised heart, there is an operation of God not made with hands where he operates on your heart and he cuts away that resistor. Everybody is born with a built-in resistor to truth. Everybody is born with a resistor to truth. And that resistor is taken away. That thing against God is removed. Glory to God. And he makes us so we love truth. Our ears are circumcised. Our eyes are circumcised. When we meet people, we don't look to see what they're wearing. We meet their spirit. We know who they are. Amen? When we hear truth, we know it's truth, or we know it's a lie. Wonderful. Wonderful. I can't get over it. It's so wonderful. When Paul went to Ephesus, he met some people, he knew there was something wrong here. And he said to them, uh, when did you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Well, they said, we never even heard there was a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Aha, Paul said, what about your baptism? How were you baptized? They said, well, we had the baptism of John. He said, all right, now you get baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. And they did, and they received the Holy Ghost. And everybody heard them speaking in tongues and prophesying. They got hold of the root of the problem. Amen. So now, Stephen... Stephen is going to be killed because he's given them the truth. Here's a bunch of, of religious people with an uncircumcised heart, uncircumcised of ear and, and, and eye. Uh, they, they're just like their fathers. They're fighting truth. They're fighting everything that's real. Is they think it's unreal. What's unreal, they believe. And Stephen stood his ground full of the Holy Ghost. 
And he told them the whole story. And they knew it was true. They knew that was the history. They knew it was true. And when he saw them gnashing on him, he said, why do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did? Resisting the Holy Ghost. I don't know, I seem to want to analyze that. Resisting the Holy Ghost. How do we resist the Holy Ghost? We resist the Holy Ghost because we don't want to pay the price. We resist the Holy Ghost because we think we'd be more popular if we don't do certain things that we know is there in the book. Oh, I couldn't do that. I, I just couldn't have that, that name. I just couldn't go along with that. Resisting the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is here to take out a bride for Jesus Christ. He's here to get us out of all of our problems. He's here to have us ready when Jesus comes. He's here to see that we miss the whole tribulation. He's here to do everything for us. He's working day and night. Why are we resisting him? Why are you resisting him? Let's take it to our own individual heart. Why do I resist him? Why do you resist him? I think it's time we take stock. I think it's high time we look deep into our own hearts and say, why am I resisting the Holy Ghost? You resist the Holy Ghost when you resist the powers that be. You resist the Holy Ghost when you refuse the Word of God as it's written. You resist the Holy Ghost when you refuse to be baptized the way you ought to. You know what the book says, but you have a certain formula that you're going to stick to or die. You're resisting the Holy Ghost. That's a terrible thing. Why haven't you got the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You're resisting the Holy Ghost. That isn't the way your church teaches it. We don't care how churches teach it. There are umpteen churches in the world, and everybody is teaching after their own fashion. We're talking about the Word of God. We're talking about the Word of God. doesn't make any difference what anybody else teaches. What does the Word say? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ear. Why do you always resist the Holy Ghost? as your fathers did. When you think of Judgment Day and the multitudes that have been lulled to sleep by doctrines and they come up before the judgment seat of God and they thought they were all set and they never had that resisting thing that we were born with ever removed from them until they're pliable in the hands of God, pliable in the hands of the Holy Ghost, where they can receive the word if it kills them. They'll take it, that, that's the truth. That's the truth. I know that's truth. That's the way I am. I know that's the truth. Hit me right on top of the head, I receive it. Because your heart is circumcised because you've done it God's way. I never was so thankful for anything in my life when God showed us how and when we could be circumcised in our hearts. And I think everybody that's ever had it says the same thing. It's such a relief. It's such a wonderful thing to do this God's way. When he said that, they went wild. Who do you think set them on fire? They're religious people. Who do you think set them on fire? Satan, of course. He can't stand God's word. He can't stand truth. 
Satan set those people crazy. I remember I was working in the Baptist church. And when I went to these people, they wanted me to come in and help them. My husband built the building and they wanted me to come in and help. And I said, well, I'm not coming in unless you know who I am. I have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I've spoken in other tongues. They said, we know all of that, but we know what you've got is real. Come on in and help us. So I went in and I worked like a Trojan. And when the church got full and got all fixed up, they said to me, you know, we can't have the stigma of Pentecost on this church. And I thought, my God, my God. You know, I never went back. Well, I shouldn't say never. Uh, I was tempted to go back for the children, to help in a children's summer camp. But I shouldn't have even done that. But as far as that group were concerned, I severed my ties. They couldn't have the stigma of the Holy Ghost on their church. It's wiped out. There's a building there, but the church is gone. The people are gone. There's nothing left. And that's the way it is all over the world. They're resisting the Holy Ghost. They resist the Holy Ghost more than they do Jesus. It's no wonder Jesus said, what you do to me will be forgiven. But what you do with the Holy Ghost will never be forgiven. They got so furious, they started to stone him. And while they were stoning him, he said, I see heaven open. <laughs> Mother, that must have just made them so angry. I'm telling you, he was relaxed. He was, he was in the Lord. He said, I see heaven open. I see Jesus standing. He was coming to meet me. He stood up to meet him. <laughs> No, he was having a party. And while they were stoning and they took their, clo their cloak and laid it at, the, at Saul's feet, who later would be Paul. And Saul was consenting to his death. And it was the way that Stephen met death. He, Saul must have seen the reality of the release. Hallelujah. The release that Stephen had. I believe that was the greatest factor in Saul's conversion. And sometimes it's just what you see. It's seeing Jesus in somebody. It's seeing him in somebody. And they buried Stephen. And Paul went crazy. He just went out worse than he'd ever been. Killing people, hauling them out of prison, women, children didn't matter. But God knocked him down. God knocked him down. Why do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did? You uncircumcised of heart and ear shall we bow our heads. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, minister to every one of us, Lord. Minister to us, I beseech thee, Lord. Minister to every heart, Lord. Melt hearts, I pray thee. My God, cause us to be willing to do it your way, Lord. My God, let the peace and the rest, the happiness, the security come to every heart I pray thee grant repentance unto life Lord 
to everyone. I ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.